Good morning. It is, it's still getting used to being in a conference room again, but it's is wonderful to, to be part of this session um, and for the folks online um, as well. Hello. Um, today we're taking a big picture look. I feel like our title, I was, I was joking with some of the panelists earlier, it's like you couldn't almost be more broad. It's like from pre-K all the way to 16, and by the way, like let's go local and global. Um, but we, you know, it's the end of the conference. Everybody's consumed a lot of interesting ideas here. So um, we're going to leave you with some profound thoughts and interesting examples. Um, my name is Jeff Young. I'm the managing editor of EdSurge. Um, we uh, cover the future of learning. Um, we're a nonprofit newsroom, and we've been doing that for about 10 years. I also host the weekly EdSurge podcast, which um, we're, we're very excited about that. So check that out if you don't uh, listen to that already, wherever podcasts are, or wherever you find them. Um, now, um, I want to just say really quickly, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a nice small room. We, we are here together in person, so I'm definitely going to leave time for questions. Um, and so be thinking as, as we're talking up here um, what you might want to add, questions or comments um, that are relevant. And let me just introduce um, who else is up here, and then we'll, we'll jump in. Um, so I'm, I'm happy to say these are great panelists with some, uh, and I've gotten to know them better in just preparing, and I, you're in for a treat. Um, David Freed um, is the Chief Operating Officer for Crimson Education. Um, and which is not affiliated with Harvard, but he did go to Harvard, so that's that's his very crimson. Um, if we had to pick his color, um, it takes the barrier. Uh, excuse me, it takes away the barriers of geography and legacy, and sees students, many of which are first generation, um, that reach their fullest potential. Um, that's his his day job. But I want to say just some fun things about our panelists. And for David, I learned that um, his parents are both professors. Um, one math and one physics, and so they had a blackboard in the dining room when he was a kid, um, which I'm, I'm like, should I do that for my kids? That's an interesting idea. Um, uh, next, we have Jade Roth, and she's the CEO of Avenue Learning, which reimagines the relationship between education and of the transnational uh, learner. I love that word, transnational. Um, and so um, she's looking at both localized culture um, and language of the learner for both of those. She spent 34 years um, before doing this um, working for Barnes & Noble, which almost sounds impossible, but then I learned that she started when she was 17 at Barnes & Noble, so that adds up. Um, and then, um, so, uh, doing everything from starting as like a cashier, I think, as I understand, so being an executive doing strategic things and thinking big thoughts for, for Barnes and Noble. Um, and, and last but not least, we have Tomohiro Hoshi, um, who is at the Stanford Online High School, head of school at Stanford Online High School, which is affiliated with Stanford um, and is, is, is on their new um, auxiliary campus, but was you know, really part of that. Um, and he's been long doing this rigorous um, education that crosses boundaries of geography and economics. Um, he grew up in Japan um, and so has that, um, that cultural perspective of, of, you know, being, went to Stanford and has been in the U.S. for a while, but, but grew up in Japan, so brings that. So anyway, thank you um, for, for being here. Thanks to our panelists for doing this. Um, I'm going to jump right in. So how are, um, this is a, a question for, for all of you, and it shows how big our topic and, and um, ambition is here. Um, how are things different now versus pre-pandemic from what you're seeing? Um, and, and what has the pandemic taught us, um, especially about online learning? Cool. Uh, I'll take the first step. So I think uh, the obvious difference is that everyone's gone online. So here at Crimson, we uh, started dreaming about an online high school uh, a decent amount of time ago. In 2018, we started to file licenses to get ready. We were always looking at April 2020 as being our uh, big date uh, to, uh, you know, really open the doors. And of course, that turned out to be a pretty fortunate time to open an online high school. So we've been kind of a passenger in this whole movement towards being online. And what I think we've seen is that the benefits of online learning are immense um, and that they really apply transnationally. So this is the idea of flexibility, the things you can do online that you can't do in person. Uh, we talk a lot at Crimson about this idea of geographic equity. Um, the idea that previously you're limited in the quality of the education that you receive by the best teacher within, I don't know, 15 to 20 walking miles of your house. What's the best school you can attend? Where do the teachers live? And what we can do online is we can extend that quali high quality teachers that live in dense urban areas around the globe. 
um, that live in select countries. And part of our mission with the Global Academy, our high school, is to further this idea, to have students from around the globe able to really realize that. A lot of our first adopters have been students from rural backgrounds or countries that uh, don't normally have access to this high quality of education. We started in New Zealand, but we've seen uptick from places like Costa Rica, South Africa. Um, and so I think that's definitely been one of the lessons. On the other hand, we've obviously all seen the difficulties that some of this can have. Um, COVID and learning online has compounded feelings of isolation for a lot of students. There's probably a mental health crisis in this country, especially among teenagers and young adults that we're not talking enough about. Um, I don't think online learning is at fault for that. I think it actually can solve some of those, which I'm sure we'll talk about more, but um, I think that's something that we definitely need to reckon with as we move more and more to having hybrid modes of learning. Thanks. Jade, um, so yeah, like what's different and what has the pandemic taught us? Um, well, I think the pandemic has been both an accelerant and a barrier um, to online education in specific. In many ways, it's accelerated the, um, uh, the embrace of online education as a valid and credible model, uh, particularly outside of the U.S., where it has been less uh, seen that way. Um, but I think it's also been a barrier for many students who have had their economic lives up uh, just in upheaval. Uh, and things like continuing their studies, persistence, how to be successful, have really uh, been stressed. And if you look at the world landscape, you see regions and countries that have had particular challenges with the pandemic um, that have also accelerated some of the challenges that students have. So the recent unrest um, in Colombia is a prime example. There are examples all over the world. So, uh, you know, you could say from an online learning perspective, there have been positives, if there are any positives out of all of this, positives and negatives that have come from the pandemic. I think what really happens next is um, how we recognize those things will continue to be here for quite some time because this is clearly not over yet in any way. Uh, and how do we then try to solve those problems that existed before but are exacerbated by current conditions? And I think that's the next big challenge. Thanks. And Tomohiro, um, any, any starters for us here? Sure, yeah. Yeah, I definitely agree. Uh, the dif uh, difference that the pandemic made was the, uh, the size of the participants in this uh, market differently. You know, st more students and more teachers and more schools and programs and so forth. Uh, there's no denial of that. And uh, I think the, uh, correspondingly, uh, the uh, market has been also kind of, the, co the nature of the competition has been also uh, changed a little bit. So, uh, we, you know, I, I'm from Stanford Online High School, which has been uh, there for uh, about 16 years. But uh, um, the competitions that I see more of at this point is the competition definitely between different online programs, obviously. So there are more online high schools and online schools, etc. So even though there are more students there, uh, I think the difference in terms of the quality of these programs and such uh, has been uh, more uh, in evaluation. And also, I think the competition between uh, traditional schools and also online schools uh, might be more evident in the past. Also, you know, as I've, been, I've done this uh, for a long time, right? Uh, traditional you know, schools might not have seen us as uh, you know, serious competitors in the past, but at this point, uh, you know, more, more and more students from traditional schools might be interested in this kind of online uh, option. So uh, there's that sort of competition there as well. Now, one thing that, um, one thing I think has become clear, and some, you know, already Jade mentioned this, is it's highlighted existing challenges that were there already with the education system in various ways. And I guess I wanted to push on that a little bit and say, to, if each of you could talk about what is maybe, and we can start with you, Jade, of what is an example of something that the pandemic showed was kind of broken or dysfunctional or whatever, you know, word you might want to use, um, that is almost like a, opportunity for change or certainly a something that we've realized may still need addressing even you know as we come out of the pandemic you know hopefully sooner or later it's unclear whether or when we'll be really out of it but you know as we shift back to something closer to normalcy is there a, a, a problem you could that you see as as one of those 
Uh, well, I think there are, there are a bunch, but just to focus on one, if you think from a macro perspective, uh, it really exposed challenges in infrastructure. So bandwidth or electricity, even basic infrastructure needs that are required for online learning, access to technology, things like that. Um, and as the economic um, as the economic hit came, some of those things really started to fall apart, whether they're in growth countries or growth markets or more mature markets. And so I think that's one of the first things that it exposed. Um, aside from that, then you have all the macroeconomic trends of people being um, unable to attend school. But I thought one of your comments was really interesting because we actually saw that too. So. Um, you know, for Avenue Learning, we play at, at a, the affordability scale. So um, we're bringing degrees from from Western countries into growth markets at in-market pricing and in-market language and culture. And what we actually found was that they were considerably lower priced than some of the existing higher education opportunities in the countries where we're delivering education on behalf of our partners. And um, we saw a huge uptick in what I would call the traditional student migrating into this um, more international education affordable online model than we ever expected. So in other words, can you give an example, like what country, were, were, where so did that happen? If we look at um, Mexico, we had a large influx of um, young students, so undergraduate, first time going to college, who were opting into these programs instead of going to the college that they would have traditionally had attended because all of a sudden it was more expensive, their parents couldn't afford it, they saw, a, a, in this case, a U.S. degree as being um, having uh, the same type of credibility as the education that they would have gotten from a very great school in Mexico, um, but just the cost differential was uh, too much for them to pass up. So. Hmm. Tom Hero, do you want to jump in with something that this exposes uh, that might be something that can be addressed now, uh, you know? Sure, yeah, just to follow up on this point, yeah, I mean, Great. the U.S. could be another example too, right? Everybody has seen this uh, report on the number of uh, even public schools which is going to continue their online pro uh, you know, programs for the upcoming fall and so forth. So. Uh, definitely, and uh, just to come back to the core point of the question, I think uh, the issue that the pandemic really showed uh, was broken was indeed this polarization, like as uh, Jade mentioned, uh, of education and of, of many things, right? And uh, the online education came with such a promise uh, for a wider access and so forth. So on, online education in a more, you know, wider uh, distribution of education and so forth. But even prior to the pandemic, I think there's been lots of reports uh, that have shown and uh, claimed that the, uh, actually the polarization was worse. And, uh, you know, looking at the reports coming out during the pandemic time, I think the polarization was indeed even worse in various ways. But, you know, I think people have been working to, I mean, realize that. Uh, you know, as a result of the pandemic and uh, trying to focus to indeed work on that. And by, could you say a little bit more about the polarization and how that plays out? What do you mean by that? Right, right. So as Jade said, indeed, right, like, you know, for, for online uh, education, you've got to have a device in the first place and why the internet, not only that, uh, you know, so, some uh, online pedagogy might require a uh, higher level of disciplines and the independence of students. So st students might need to be trained already for that. And what kind of students might, might have been trained for that? Maybe the students with some, you know, uh, a uh, great amount of resources already. So I think uh, students who are ready for online education could take advantage of that during the pandemic, but the students who couldn't, uh, you know, who weren't ready for it, couldn't. Yeah, so and, and really these divides, it's not just about whether you have a device, um, but, but really the, you know, kind of the fluencies and, and preparedness. Yeah, that's really interesting. And David, you mentioned um, the online, the mental health, crisis, but maybe there's other, that or other ones that you see as is something being highlighted? I think, um, you know, to build off kind of what Tamahiro was talking about and, and what you just mentioned, it's not really just device, but you see massive differences from children from two-parent households, children whose parents are able to stay at home and work with them. Um, I think a lot of what's maybe understated about online learning is the technological difficulty. It's not seamless, even if you have a good Wi-Fi connection, to find where everything is. You... 
uh, we see this as we're building our online high school, there are not a lot of great solutions out there where you can go to one place for everything. You have a lot of, you know, when we're mystery shopping competitors and you're going in, you're looking at these online high schools, those students are going to nine different websites to find what they need in a classroom. Um, and so if you are not, you know, technologically fluent, if this is new to you, especially if you're a younger learner, I think that's another thing we've seen is that online learning is much better the older you are. Uh, even before the pandemic, I think one of six college learners in the U.S. was online, at least in part, showing that there was actually significant adoption of this before COVID came along. But uh, with older people, with more mature people, people more on top of it. And so... I think we've seen that that has been a struggle for a lot of people is the technological aspect and just the kind of level of responsibility you need online where there's not someone looking over your shoulder. Yeah, and I think this has been something that people that have been doing online education have known for a while, but as all these new, new suddenly new, you know, newly teaching online, I'm sure that was something that was a wake-up call um, for people. I, I want to jump into the next question because I think it's something that um, a lot of people are probably curious about too and maybe isn't getting talked about as much, which is, are you worried about a backlash against online learning? I know there's been a lot of talk about the opportunities and how this, all this usage of online tools and online learning during this pandemic, but some people had a great experience, probably through your programs, and other people may not, have had, maybe had a lousy experience or maybe they had a little bit of, of good and bad and maybe just so done with it. And I, I don't, you know, at, at, at a place like this, I haven't heard that talked about as much. Um, and I guess maybe Tomohiro, if you could start and, and just to hear your thoughts on whether there's a concern about any backlash maybe against online learning that could be counterproductive, even for programs that have been doing it a while and know what they're doing and are, you know, just getting better. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, this has been a, a big topic in our school board discussion, particularly like uh, up to probably like several months ago, uh, because as we saw uh, various news and reports, uh, again, like as you said, there are students who are enjoying their online education, but there are students who aren't. So uh, for students who haven't been uh, enjoying the online education, they might think that uh, it, this is it. Uh, so uh, you know, how is it going to impact on the number of applications to our school, et cetera, et cetera. But fortunately, you know, in the case of our school, the application number has been increasing. And I think it's due to the kind of pretty specific mission of the school and also the target of our student body. So uh, prior to the pandemic, we've been having enough of applications and we keep the uh, focus and the target uh, of our education. So in, our, in the case of our school, I, I'm not concerned at this moment yet. Uh, however, definitely, uh, when we look at the uh, online education market uh, as a whole, uh, there may, may, may be some programs which might uh, have grown so much, uh, you know, which might have relied on some, uh, you know, uh, increase, uh, like a radical increase of interest due to the pandemic. So I think there might be some backlash, uh, and, uh, you know, I think some organization might need to be prepared for it. Yeah. Jade, do you want to add anything to this? Um, I think of online as a modality uh, and education as engagement. So I think that, um, you know, it's really what you make of it. And I think that that's got to be the focus is not whether the modality is right or wrong, but whether the education itself is engaging. Um, you know, one of the things that we're fortunate about is we have worked with university partners who have been in online for decades. And so they have really focused on that engagement piece. They weren't just thrown into online because of COVID. Uh, and I think that's really helped people to stay engaged. But I do think modality is not really the question. It's what do you make of the education regardless of the modality? Yeah, and I guess, to, uh, I, I guess the, that is the, maybe the pitch. But I guess there's that always you know, the, the concern of whether you know, people might, despite your saying that, see, so like, well, I had a bad experience. Um, so I guess, David, do you have anything to add to, you know, whether that backlash could, could affect enrollments? Yeah, I'd probably make two points on this. The first is that I think, as it relates to online education, there's this myth out there that no one was doing it before COVID. And I think as it relates to a backlash or people thinking about it, there were five states prior to COVID that mandated that you take an online course to graduate high school. There are states off in the middle of the country, like Michigan, Virginia, Alabama, Florida, but it was already a requirement with places like Georgia, West Virginia, considering it too. 
So there's nearly a fifth of states in the US that either had this on the books or were going to make it a requirement for graduation for high school students. 91% of kids in Michigan were doing it, um, I think in 2019. And uh, we had about 500,000 kids in the US that learned exclusively online. So I think the baseline was already much more pro online than it was. I think, to your point, there probably will be a backlash. I don't think that's gonna stop the surge. I think online education is frankly a, probably a pretty easy punching bag. There are kids, as we've talked about, that it's not gonna work for. It's not, if you're out there trying to paint that narrative, if you're out there trying to find kids, it's not gonna be hard to do that, to find kids where it didn't work for them. It's um, going to be easy to write those stories, to kind of chip away at it, because I think a lot of people have this kind of romanticized view of what education has been for kids across the country right now. Um, but online education, as I was talking about before, is gonna offer those kids better teachers and they offer them more flexibility, this, idea that you can't take AP classes, you can't take classes in computer science because your, kit, your school just doesn't offer them or the teacher doesn't live in that area. Those are ideas that hopefully are gonna go out the window and hopefully those things will over time continue to attract people to what I think people were buying into before COVID. But I wouldn't be surprised to see that there will be a campaign against it because the success rates won't be 100%, which is fine. They're not 100% the way we do it. But I think Jade made a good point about modality. It's just a different option and it's a different medium for people to experience it. Um, so as long as we accept that it's not the only medium, that the optimal might be a mix of those, um, I think it should continue to go up, but I'm sure there will be headwinds in the media and our stuff like that. Um, so I will open this up for questions uh, after uh, from the audience after this. Um, so be thinking of those if, if, if folks have things that have bubbled up um, in their minds as they're, as they're done. But I, I, I wanna segue to to the, uh, to the international component here. And actually, David, maybe we'll start with you. Um, of what, um, you know, how is it different in different parts of the world? What are some things you're seeing? Because obviously, just like there's not a uniform answer to any of these questions, of course, but I'm interested in some specifics that have been gleaned as, as you all have done your work in like what areas of the, of the world have had, you know, kind of interesting, you know, differences in the adoption of online um, school or, or tech enabled school um, versus others? Yeah, I think that's an interesting question to my, to the point I was just going on. I think the biggest pushback to online learning kind of paradoxically is the places that are right now the best off. So the places that have the best in-person options don't want to live with the inconveniences of being online. So, so they're the most resistant. They're the most resistant. So I think you see places like even New York City or places like San Francisco that you know haven't really made that full switch to online or haven't embraced it necessarily as quickly. But places that we see like, I'll take a couple, South Africa, Costa Rica, Dubai, those are all places that found us when we launched our online high school. We so they came knocking. They're they like, came knocking. We uh, found lots of students from them. South Africa is actually a good example of a country that 10 years ago, the government was starting sort of this set of online resources for schools to access and for students to access. So they, they've actually been ahead of the curve a bit, as has places like Australia. But a lot of these places are not given the same high quality of international teachers you find in a London and a New York and a Paris. Um, so they're more and more open to what these kind of online curricula provide. Um, and I think you also have another interesting segment of this. I'm curious, Tom, here what you see is that we see a lot of students in East Asia who are very open to this because the culture over there is, in general, a little more online than in the United States. It's a little more common to be doing you know, all your transactions through your phone, to be, um, ed tech is already so big there. India is another big one where, again, this question of access looms much larger than the question of you know, what's kind of the ideal way to learn. Sure, more than um, perception, it's, it's the tech. And yeah. especially, you know, they have infrastructure problems, but like they're very open to this because this is the way for them to get access and to reach things that they would have had trouble reaching otherwise. So I think we've seen a lot of openness and a lot of willingness to experiment in those places too. Um, I think that there's a, an understanding that we're going to try lots of different things. I might get educated lots of different ways. Those are a lot of parts of the world where you have huge markets for adult learning. I think China and India especially are very big for that. Japan has been doing the online high school thing for a long time. So I think a lot of the rest of the world, I wouldn't say is ahead of the U.S. Certainly the U.S. has, I think, the highest proportion of children who learn online even before the pandemic. But they're catching up and they're definitely interested in pursuing it too. Yeah, Tom Hero, let's go to you next on this one. Sure, sure, yeah. So in my view, right, as you pointed out, there is this phenomenon that maybe like some East Asian countries are so open to, right, this kind of mode of 
uh, education. I, I think there is a little bit of a difference in terms of the um, like how they see what education should be like. And I think this is to your point, uh, perhaps, because in this country, I feel like, as you said, like, oh, you know, education is about engagement and uh, a good classroom should come with great engagement and, you know, great interactions between students and teachers engaging students, you know, uh, effectively, et cetera. But that's not necessarily the kind of the best education maybe that you know people in some of the, these countries might see. Like so, I grew up in Japan, as you introduced me, Jeff, and uh, I think there it's like in my view, maybe there might have been more of a curriculum-based kind of view on education. Here is the curriculum, and this is the kind of you know supposed effect of the curriculum. And uh, we go for it, right? Like I, I would like to send students, my, my students, to, you know, for that curriculum, whatever, you know, however it's taught in, in, in some ways, right? So I think uh, when somebody has that sort of view, uh, you know, uh, on online education, you know, there are some effective way of del del delivering a product for that, right? Like a cur good curriculum and good. Uh, lecture-based uh, kind of right uh, online education for them uh, instead of like having a live classes effectively online and so forth. So I think that there may be some more scalability opportunities in East Asian countries, if my view uh, is uh, right. You know, in any ways. Thanks. And Jade, what are you seeing in different parts of the world and differences? Yeah, I would definitely agree with South Africa. I worked there in 2017, and um, we worked with local universities to bring their programs online. And the demand was astounding. I just The programs grew so quickly, uh, we actually weren't well prepared for it. But, um, but I think that, that shows the opportunity in a lot of different areas. And we're certainly seeing that. Um, from both a regulatory perspective, as you look at, say, India, which is now opening up to online for the first time ever, that's going to bring huge opportunities in that market. Um, and again, I do think that while there may be a backlash, um, there's also a lot to be said for the credibility of online sort of coming in at this very difficult time for the world and providing a solution. Whether, you know, people say it's as good or better or worse, almost doesn't matter. It was a way to keep things moving, and um, there's a lot to be said for that. That's a that's a great that's a great point. Well, I do want to you know we are all here. Uh, those in the room, you know, you all have gathered here. Let's make the most of this and. and I would love to hear some questions. We don't have a microphone for COVID uh, reasons, but we if you ask a question, I will repeat it back so the folks um, watching online and so the record has that. So um, is there anybody that wants to ask our panelists um, any or share an experience um, or your own observation? Yes, in the front, please. Great question. So, like having some classroom in person, and and so what's I mean? So you're. Oh, that great question. Um, does anyone want to start first? Sure. Yeah. yeah. So I, I definitely would like to. Um, First, I agree with the kind of assumption of this question because I've been saying like in the past, so let's say like 15 or 16 years ago when we started our school, you know, it, it was like oh, online school or traditional school, right? There has been that sort of right. It was like a binary. Right? Yeah, but now it's more of a spectrum. Like my school is like 10% online and 90%, you know, in person. And I think everybody is looking for everybody, including students and schools, right? I think they are looking for the kind of best mix that they should be getting at. So I think uh, we can kind of look at the current market that way differently. So uh, in my view, definitely, uh, so our school is, for instance, uh, primarily online, but uh, we do have some, like, you know, prior to the COVID at least, and we brought some, some uh, stuff back at this point, but uh, some in-person events, like residential programs sometimes, or some uh, meetups among students. Uh, I think our school community online has been hugely re relying on that. So I think there's got to be some sort of mix even for more few the uh, online programs. Uh, and then, you know, some, sometimes people ask me also, like, what's the right ratio uh, of, like, online and in-person, right? Also, you know, asynchronous and synchronous, et cetera. 
But I do think that in our case, at least, uh, you know, probably we are 98% online <laughs> because there are only a very uh, like a limited amount of time throughout the year during the uh, you know uh, during the year that students can meet. Uh, but that some, somehow works out for students to build a good community and so forth. So uh, yeah. Sorry, let me repeat that one. So what about part-time students in the school? Yeah, so for instance, in our school, we do have part-time students who might not get diplomas from us, and uh, full-time students might get from, uh, diplomas from our school, but there are students who are actually getting diplomas from other schools uh, in our school as well as uh, in other online schools nowadays. Uh, I, I think they are uh, often a good part of the community as well. They bring in their specific interest in uh, you know, a specific subject, like, oh, I'm excelling in math, and oh, I finally found this. Uh, great uh, mass PR uh, in the school, while I work on other projects with my folks in uh, brick and mortar school and so forth. So I think part-time concepts uh, can uh, still work out very well. What about some, about uh, David, maybe about the mix? Um, what is, you know, kind of what do you, what mixer are you seeing and what is, how does, the, how is the mix going between online and some in person? Yeah, so we have, you know, in our in our core business, um, which is admissions consulting, helping kids around the world, and in our high school, we have a lot of part-time learners. So people who take their traditional school and do, do stuff online as well on the side, I think it gets to the question of being able to take stuff you can't take at your normal school, but they, they really fit in from a socialization standpoint pretty well. So for our online high school, we do a lot of it through Slack. We find that we have a pretty robust community of people joining in, people commenting, they have their own Discord, and what we found is that if we empowered students to do it, um, so we allow student leaders to do it, they feel very comfortable in those settings. Um, I think I read the other day the average Gen Z person is spending seven hours a day online. Um, and so, average Gen Z seven hours online? Yeah. Wow, during a pandemic time, I guess that's yeah. probably, yeah. And they, I mean, there's some, I, I won't pretend like I remember the exact number, but like a healthy proportion of them prefer to communicate in person. Um, with the stat in the article being about how 70% of them like to break up with people over text. Um, sorry, they prefer to communicate through their phone. Um, so I think that actually this generation is different and, and they're very open and very accepting of relationships that they've cultivated fully online. Um, and so a lot of our students don't really report that as being an issue. What they want is actually more opportunities to meet people online, more spaces that they can do extracurriculars, they can do projects together, they can kind of create deeper bonds because that is the way that they communicate with a lot of their friends. They hang out virtually instead of in person anyway. Um, the other thing I would say on the kind of part-time point and, and this point is that we saw with a lot of our students in, in the core business from around the world, including a lot of the ones I, I personally work with, that their schools went from 35 hours a time a week during the pandemic to 15. A lot of schools around the U.S. really shortened their schedules, they're in school less, they're focused on their core classes, things like you know art and stuff you can't do at home are just completely canceled, um, PE and stuff like that. And what they actually really liked is they actually like having that extra time to reinvest in other things. They're socializing more with their friends outside of school now that they do learn online. And what they, I think a lot of them talk to me about is they like the decoupling of their socialization, of that kind of social and emotional needs from academic learning. They liked having the classroom for learning and not necessarily the place where they were supposed to bond with people because that is tough in discussions. That is, if that is your outlet, that's how you end up passing notes, that's how you end up uh, trying to do a bit of both and they were like I can focus on school when I'm in school and then when I'm out of school I don't have that kind of layer hanging over everything. So I'd say with both part-time students what we see with a lot of our full-time students in the uh, Online Academy is that a lot of them do opt for that they just take that slightly smaller school load almost like you do in college and then um, They take more of that socialization outside of it That's so interesting how that's decoupling that piece of what we all kind of probably think of as like high school or some or school experience. Um, Jay, did you have anything to add? And then we'll go to another question. Um, the only thing I would add is I think the best of online allows the learner to be decoupled from time and space and unfettered by time and space. But I do think that ultimately some type of hybrid learning is probably the best and where things will ultimately go. What hybrid is, whether it's in person or uh, synchronous um, online or anything else I think remains to be seen but I do think that allows the learner to capitalize on the things that make that learner most successful you know we've found that we've had to punctuate our uh, fully online asynchronous 
uh, education with weekly engaged synchronous sessions that are open for either a lesson that needs to be had or for general Q&A or whatever the needs of that cohort or that class are. And that has worked very well, um, which is not something that, these uni that the universities we serve do in the US. Any other questions? Yes. Um. Let me repeat the question. We have a high school student asking a question here and saying that it's, uh, there are extracurriculars like sports and, 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 and that, and how do you address those in an online format? Cool, I'm happy to take the first stab at it. So I think there are a couple different ways. So for extracurricular activities, we feel like a lot of those can be online. So obviously they're gonna feel different if you know, you're know you training for model, you went online, and then you wanna go to the conference in person, we think you can do that. If you can't go to the conference in person, obviously there are things lost from that. What well, we think kind of the dominant model is that you do some of your training, you do a lot of your work online, but then you retain some of that in-person element. We've also spoken to you know partnering with schools um, so, you know, you go online to, you know, the high school uh, that we have, but then locally you're still able to compete on their sports teams and do things like that. So that's happening? That is something that, you know, we're in discussions about and I think we will have in the school. Because um, I just couldn't picture that one in, you know, on, online. I know there's eSports, but let's, you know. Yeah, and I mean, to be fair, that's uh, <laughs> probably the most popular sport in that generation, so it should not be, should not be discounted. But I, I think that will be the option. And what we saw with a lot of people during the pandemic was, okay, well, maybe your school's also not the vehicle for all those things. Maybe you're deepening your connection with club sports. Maybe you're deepening your connections with other organizations that pick up the slack. And again, maybe there's a little more of a decoupling from your school being the place where you do all those activities. Um, we think that there are a meaningful proportion of learners that are certainly okay with that, where kind of these trade-offs come into play. Well, I, um, did anyone else want to jump in on that one? But I think we were getting toward the end of time. So I, I wanted to just kind of ask a final question, unless, uh, if, that's, if, if, if you'll indulge me. And I'm interested in, um, you know, the, the panel is about disrupting, and we've certainly heard examples of those, those things. But um, I'm curious to, to hear what people think when we, t we've also heard a lot of talk at this conference and elsewhere these days about equity and, you know, trying to make sure they're, you know, rethink the opportunities and make sure that they're really available more broadly and and really seeing those problems and challenges magnified or awareness being magnified um, during the pandemic. And I'm curious, I know that the things you've, even the examples you've given have pointed to pros and cons for, you know, um, diverse, for access um, and equity, um, like the AP programs and, and that, but also challenges like the digital divides. And I guess I'm, I'm curious on balance, like where you see things going and what, it, what advice or challenges or, or any, anything you have to leave us with of like how to address the, the downsides and focus, lean toward the, the positives that we've raised here, um, if, you, if, if you understand the question. Um, David, David, do you, if, I hope I made myself clearer rather, um, but David, does that, um, does that? Yeah, I, I think for us, there's probably two elements here. One's the first one I mentioned about geographic equity. Okay, well, no matter where you're born, do you have access to high quality learning? And are we leveling the play, playing field in that way? And I think the other one is understanding that online is not a mandate. Um, it's not gonna work for everyone, and so what we're doing by creating a viable online infrastructure is we're creating an alternative for students and parents that that works for. Um, and hopefully we're creating an option for many students that they can use to get to a better level. For some students that don't wanna do that, we believe that there should be in-person options and that having it online just allows them a different way to learn, a way to access and have more things they couldn't normally. So it's about flexibility, access, and um, ultimately just having more than they could if there was no online option. All right, and we have about one minute left. So Jade, 30, <laughs> it's a hard question to answer in 30 seconds, but yeah. you could do it. Um, so first I would just say that I think disruption's a funny word because I think if you look at history, most disruptions came after years and years of incremental change that sort of get forgotten when the disruption occurs. Um, and so I think uh, education in particular tends to be incrementalism more than disruption. Um, but I do think the 
the biggest thing that we all have to realize is that we haven't solved this at all. Um, we are all marching towards different solutions, then we're all trying to solve the same problems, but there's a huge opportunity to try to be really creative in solving these um, because they are big problems and they don't get solved easily or quickly overnight. So it's good because there's a huge lot of opportunity. Thanks. Tomohiro? Yeah, so I think we should, you know, if there is a, a, any view like, you know, new against old in education, right? There's a new thing came in and then kind of replace the old version with the new version, right? It's not what should happen because uh, I think there are ways for us to think about a good introduction of online resources in uh, the uh, traditional school environments to kind of narrow the uh, access uh, issues that we have seen. Well, join me in thanking our panelists. Um, we, we really appreciate um, David, Jade, and, and Tomohiro. <laughs>